Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, welcome to Club Cosmos! I didn't hear you! <laughs> My name is Wilson de Silva and I'm the editor of Cosmos magazine, Australia's number one science magazine, and I will be your host tonight uh, for the third and last of our jelly wrestle around the science of biodiversity. Uh, it's International, International Year of Biodiversity, so it's only appropriate, I think. Um, tonight's topic is, would the Earth be better off without us? Yes, people, we, we've been bad, but just how bad? Uh, should we all drink the Kool-Aid and give the planet a break? Or do we have redeeming features that justify our continuation as a species? Like a loudmouth, heavy-drinking cousin who's nevertheless brilliant at fixing cars for free, for example. So uh, to tackle this issue, we have ass assembled a distinguished panel of scientists, real live scientists, um, who work in biodiversity. They will sit in judgment on our species and uh, pronounce the final verdict. If this goes bad for humans, your drinks will be spiked. If it goes well, you won't really know the difference. Uh, let me introduce you to our fabulous real life scientists who have put down their um, Indiana Jones uh, whips to be here with us tonight. Firstly, at the, my extreme right, and I don't mean that politically, uh, we have Scott Rayberg, a member of the Center for Environmental Sustainability at the University of Technology, Sydney. Scott is a fluvial geomorphologist and hydrologist with expertise in catchment management, environmental flows, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling, remote sensing, and data analysis. Scott predominantly works in semi-arid environments like a university and on rivers, lakes, and wetlands, and focuses his research on diversity and complexity in physical systems, and particularly in applying them to multidisciplinary approaches, including physical, biological, and social aspects, to uh, solving scientific and natural resource management problems. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Scott Rayburn! Thank you for that enthusiastic response. And next to my, uh, to the middle there, we have Stephen Rowe. He is the director of the Computational Biomechanics Research Group, which studies the forces that drive the evolution of body architecture in both living and fossil species. Um, they, his group uses the finite element analysis, FE, for those in the, in the game, a tool long used by engineers to predict and simulate the behavior of man-made objects like you know, wing nuts and space shuttles, um, but not usually adopted in biological studies. Um, his group has developed models of things like the great white shark and the extinct terror bird Andagalornus. Is that how you pronounce it? Andagalornus. Andagalornus. His research at the University of New South Wales ranges from lions and thylacines to reptile dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and Gigantosaurus. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Stephen Rowe! And to my, uh, to my immediate right uh, is David Wharton. He's an ecological statistician and an associate professor in the Department of Stats at the University of New South Wales, uh, where his research focuses on developing new methodologies for data analysis uh, for ecological research. As a leader of the EcoStats Research Group, uh, his team evaluates the existing methodologies and develops entirely new ones. Uh, just makes it up while exporting the application of new methods to model species distribution and the effects of climate change on invertebrates. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome David Wharton? Okay, guys, you've, you've been keeping track of the press. The coverage of human beings is not too good, is it? We're not looking, as a species, we're looking as if we're a little bit, you know, not so good for the planet. Any immediate reaction? Well, for starters, um, for starters, uh, William and Katie getting married next year, so you know that's got to make. Sure <laughs> that's exactly what's wrong with humans, isn't it? Focus on the detail. Uh, sorry, focus on the margins rather than detail. But seriously, if if you looked at if you came in from outer space and you looked at human beings, we would not look too good from an environmental perspective. Would that be right, Stephen? How would you take? You've got a you've got a longer view. You've you've looked at the paleontology of animals. Uh, certainly no. Um, you know, it's a general consensus now that, that humans are damaging the, the climate. Sorry, we are damaging the planet with respect to, to climate and in many other respects. Um, I, yeah, I don't think there's much, much doubt about that. Although, if you put it in a geological context, um, it's, 
there certainly have been more catastrophic um, events. Because we're actually going through a, some people would argue that the uh, in, impact of humanity, basically modern civilization, the kind of stuff that we've had since the Industrial Revolution for you know 200 odd years, that it's kind of been equivalent to a mass extinction event. Am I, is that sort of stuff hyperbole or is that for real? Certainly it's, it's a lot of people would call this the, the sixth mass extinction. Wow. Um, and predictions are pretty dire. Okay, so the predictions are pretty dire for, not for humans, obviously, because they're doing pretty well. Well, actually, humans are fabulously successful. As large mammals, we are so far above anything that's existed before, it's not funny. Um, but our impact on other species has certainly been devastating uh, so far, particularly devastating, actually, in Australia. But you, you, so you've got this long view. You're saying that there have been extinctions in the past, so mm. what, we should, perhaps we shouldn't worry so much about them? Maybe well, it humans... Are, on your perspective. Well, give us a perspective, uh, um, Stephen. Well, look, uh, the end Permian event um, was certainly um, the most catastrophic Event. That's how long ago? Oh, don't put me on the spot. I won't do it on it's the like time scale. We're talking, hundreds of millions of years. Certainly hundreds. All right. Um, uh, we're looking at at least 90% of species disappearing from the fossil record. Um, no one's projecting that with respect to the, the current extinction event, but, but you know, we're, we're certainly starting to get there. David, is that true? And nobody is exp ex uh, predicting 90% as a reaction to, a response to um, human activity? I wouldn't say no one would predict it. Uh, I guess um, when you're talking about the future, you, when you're talking about the future, you don't really know. Sort of, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. It's it's crystal ball gazing. Um, uh, like we've got, we we certainly know a lot about um, if if uh, this much carbon dioxide is going to be um, uh, re released over the next sort of uh, century, then uh, we think sea level will go up by this much and temperature might go up by this much. But there's all sorts of ifs and buts and maybes about. Um, about um, about other there's also there's there's big uncertainties that can have sort of big, big impacts like does the Greenland ice sheet um, sort of uh, go or does 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 it not and 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 um, I don't know there's there's all sorts of you know uh, just within the last ten years thinking about the, all the things that have happened in the last ten years. Um, um, the, the, the biggest events that have happened, people haven't, like the global financial crisis and 9-11, and like um, hardly anyone predicted either. But Stephen's got a point though, when you talk yeah. about, you know, sea levels rising one metre, two metres, even the worst case scenario, 2100, you know, six metres, um, that's peanuts in comparison to that what's is, happened in the history of the is, Earth. That is peanuts, yeah, in a, in a relative context. Give, it, give us a sense of how bad it could really get. Come well, on. Well, how bad it could really be? Look at it in terms of, uh, uh, um, in terms of temperature. Um, there have been fluctuations uh, wherein we're looking at about 9 degrees Celsius. And that's quite rec very recently in geological terms. Because we're so worried, us, like, in terms of today, we're worried about things like 2 or 3 we're degrees. We're talking about 2 or 3 degrees, and there's no doubt that will have massive consequences. But... Um, if we're looking even on a short geological time scale, um, the, at, during the last peak of the last uh, uh, ice age, the, the last glacial maximum, we're looking at an average fall in temperatures in Australia of around about nine degrees Celsius. So, what is it? Is it when we pe people start using the words like catastrophic, or um, you know this this will be you know this will be catastrophic? Are they talking about like? Um, seaside real estate, or are they talking about like species? Well, let's put it to put it in context. Uh, the focus immediately here is on climate change, and that's massive potentially. Um, but remember, this is just being overlain on top of a whole suite of other um, very damaging um, uh, um, activities by humans. Um, climate change is is the topic of the moment, and deservedly so. But um, with respect to land clearance, introduction of, of, of exotic species uh, and, and many other um, ways in which humans are damaging the planet, um, climate change may just be that final straw. Um, it, it's happening anyway. I see you're saying we've been we, bad we're in other places. the planet with or without climate change. So you're saying we've been bad in other places. Diversity. Scott, in, in your case, um, we've seen... Uh, people keep telling us now that... Um, scientists, I mean 
that uh, the stuff that's happening on the coasts on the coasts of countries is actually quite dramatic, and that's an example of you know some of it is not necessarily climate change; it's just human impact. Would that be right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would follow up on what you're just saying in that uh, uh, you know climate change is the big hot button issue, but my own research and, and that of others is would suggest that it's um, biodiversity loss from habitat destruction that's the real issue here. At, at none of those other um, mass extinction events in the past have, have there been uh, agents deliberately breaking up landscapes, um, you know, uh, breaking up the connectivity of landscapes so that animals don't have the capacity to, to migrate. Uh, and habitat loss is, is basically probably going to wipe out many more species than climate change ever would. Even if we got, you know, I heard six or seven metres um, of sea level rise, well, we could go up to 72 metres of sea level rise if we lost all the ice, but I'd still argue 72 metres of sea level rise, bad for us, in Australia, we all live on the coast and 72 metres is going to drown us out, but um, a minor uh, role in species destruction, really, relative to that habitat loss and the inability of animals to, to move around and, and adapt, or plants even, to, to move around and adapt. So has climate change kind of captured all the attention of people thinking, oh my God, you know, it's going to have an impact on us as, as a species, and you know, 100 million people could be impacted by a three minute rise in Bangladesh or in Vietnam, but actually, there's a whole story of habitat destruction that nobody's paying attention to now. Right. It's moved off the front page. I would say, yeah, it's off the front page. Um, but um, there's, there's no doubt that, yeah, I, I would certainly agree with you that, that ha habitat destruction, one way or another, is, is the single most important factor here. And we're doing it regardless of what happens with climate. Climate change change can come along and, and further aggravate that, as, as Scott was saying, um, we're looking at increasingly fragmented habitats and lack of connectivity where, where species can um, uh, migrate or immigrate via, you know, land corridors, uh, etc. Um, climate change could seriously aggravate that. Um, it's going to have a, but climate change will have a, a, a catastrophic impact on humans, depending on what you call catastrophic. Um, we're talking well, tens, in real estate hundreds. terms. In real estate, real estate terms, terms, def yeah, definitely. I, w I, w I wouldn't want to be in real estate. No. Um, but Certainly, coastal real estate. Look, in terms of uh, effect on a species, let's you know, if we lost five or ten percent of humanity, um, in an evolutionary sense, to humans, you know, that's that's nothing, right? Uh, most species would go through those sorts of population fluctuations, or many would go through those sorts of fluctuations on an annual basis. Whereas, in human terms, that would actually get front pages. Oh, it's, 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 yeah, especially if it was you. Yeah. <laughs> or us. Scott, yeah. can you give us examples of, you know, the average Joe and Jane kind of activity by humans that is leading to um, ha the destruction of habitats and how that's done? You, are you talking about construction of roads and locking, breaking up forests? Or what is it? That you, give us some examples so yeah, we can visualise that. I mean, certainly road construction is going to be one of those factors, but probably, again, a relatively minor one. I mean, we are talking about, um, from an agricultural perspective at least, large-scale transformations of, of native forests and native vegetation into artificial vegetation. Um, even if we plant a forest, we go and we put a plantation in, it becomes a monoculture, which is sometimes um, native trees, but sometimes um, introduced. And in, in any case, whether it's native or not, monocultures tend not to be very favorable for biota. Again, my own work uh, really focuses on water. In Australia, water is, is really everything, and, and the way we're modifying water in the landscape means that um, a lot of the biota, particularly... Um, you know, By biota, species, you mean life. Life, yeah, plants and animals that require water to survive, which is basically everything on Earth, let's be honest, uh, save maybe a few bacteria that live on rock, more or less. Um, Everything needs water. We're taking it increasingly for ourselves, and this is taking it away from, um, from those biota. And we're looking at a situation in Australia now where we may have um, no water birds left in 15 years. Now, the impacts of climate change will take a lot longer than that to, to bite. Uh, but these things are happening now based on our own activities, what we're doing now, knowingly and deliberately, to these landscapes to transform them. And again, these are not on the front page, they're not getting research funding. But these issues, in my mind, are certainly more pressing uh, than what's going on in climate So because we're commandeering water, 
that it's basically taking away from the plates of all the other animals. I, I, I seem to recall um, that we read that something like uh, we commandeer 40% of the Earth's productivity. Surely, surely that's not accurate, is it? Can we seriously be commandeering that well, much? Look, I, I can't speak with authority on this, <laughs> but uh, that doesn't surprise me. Humans are very large mammals, uh, and, and we don't normally think of ourselves as particularly big. We think about lions and tigers and bears and elephants as, as big. Uh, you know, at a, an average of you know 60, 70 kilos, humans are big mammals, and the numbers of, of humans are, is just or, uh, are just um, extraordinary by uh, uh, historical standards. Are we the example? Are we the most? Um, the most number of species of, of a creatures of a particular species historically? Uh, in terms of large mammals, absolutely. Really? By, by a country mile. I mean, you think of other big species. You think of something like uh, the American buffalo, uh, uh, bison, that we used to thunder down the, which, you know, which the mountain range. Which undeniably had a massive impact on their environment, and the uh, estimates are that. When Europeans arrived, there were around about 60 million. Right? We have six billion. And on top of that, each one of us, certainly in the Western world, um, but increasingly in the rest of the world, is sucking up massive amounts of resources compared to a, you know, compared to a big, um, you know, some other mammal. I mean, for example, you know, one one billion can get cable television. And, uh, you know, all, all the things that that means, plasma screens or whatever else. And if the six billion left only the one billion, well, we'd need something like three or four Earths to provide the, the, um, sure. the, the food and the... So when they talk about 40% of um, the uh, productivity, they're talking about arable land, which therefore leads to which you can grow crops and feed. So it, it's a remarkable amount. If we're doing that, then that, that is crowding out the other species. But... Um, it's not just water, is it, Scott? There's other stuff. There's things like, a, there's a project, for example, to create a, a wildlife corridor uh, along the east coast of Australia. And that's basically to allow migrations of animals. Um, there's a lot of examples of humans just uh, interfering with patterns that exist, whether it's migration patterns or uh, everything from, you know, the way animals carry on their lives. And that actually blocks them from, from doing it. That's another example of habitat loss, isn't it, or habitat impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do... Uh, I mean, we're, we're pretty good in Australia about trying to, at least modern Australia, about trying to patch up some of these issues. Um, so we're trying to re-establish connectivity in places. But, uh, I mean, we're trying to basically put a Band-Aid on a, on a gaping wound here. I mean, we've done so much landscape transformation that small corridors are just not going to uh, put back the kinds of habitats that you need for for most large mammals, most large animals, um, you know, these things have home ranges much larger than the kinds of spaces that we're prepared to set aside for them. And often the lands that we're prepared to set aside are, are marginal ones. If they were any good, we'd be on them, using them. So sure, you can have that bit of land because we don't really want it. So you know, we have these kinds of issues. That, you know, and a point that just came across, which I think is an important one, is that you know, as people, we, we can look at things and say, you know, there's a social injustice in the world and we've got these third world countries and everybody should have the standard of living that we have here in Australia or in the States or in Europe. And if we ever attain that kind of equality, that social justice, there's an, an even more peril than it is in today. I mean, okay. Completely up to you. Well, let me ask the question, David. Um, do we need biodiversity? I mean, come on. Um, I guess... Um, yeah, I guess you can make cases of things like um, you know penicillin, and there's all these there's all these things that are useful to, to humans that we wouldn't have uh, that before they were found we wouldn't have known that, um, about, and so you could argue that there's all these sort of medicines and th things that sort of out there that would yet to be discovered. Um, but but frankly, I think. Um, the main, the, the value of biodiversity um, is is more sort of an as as is more of an aesthetic thing. Um, I, I, I see it as more sort of a um, sort of a um, 
uh, sort of a moral issue, sort of uh, rather than um, being being sort of trying to sort of put dollar values on 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 sort of this is worth sort of um, this you know this much so sort of, there's, there's this possible sort of financial gain to be made out of this patch of rain for us. I don't think that sort of argument is really sort of the way to go. We should be sort of trying to sort of preserve sort of biodiversity in rainforests. Well, sure, you, you can't like give an economic rather, you can't give an economic benefit. The, I remember David Suzuki's argued about this that you know penguins. Uh, if you if you can't find a commercial economic use for them, then in today's society they don't have a value, and so that's the the moral argument that you're putting forward. But um, uh, Scott, the, there's also argument. You mentioned monocultures. I mean, all you need in a monoculture is a disease to ravage through um, a species like wheat. Currently, we have wheat rust happening around the world. Uh, a nasty old strain of wheat rust is, is coming back, and it's knocking out crops all over the world. And that's what happens when you have a monoculture, when you don't have biodiversity. Isn't that right? Yeah, look, I, I would argue with you on this point, which is to say, I, I don't think the pr preservation of biodiversity is a moral issue, it's, it's a necessary issue. I mean, we as scientists have a very, very limited understanding of how the Earth works, and much of what we derive and, and uh, allows us to survive on this planet is related to species, and we're, we're not sure which species might be the keystone species, that if you just wipe out this one species, that's it for us. You can think about bees, just for example. I mean, there's a, been a, a disease of bees in the States that's wiped out 75% of um, native bee colonies there. You lose bees, you lose 70% of the agriculture that humans use to Is that right? What do bees do? Uh, do they provide ecological uh, services at no cost? I mean, they are pollinating for us almost all of our crops. So you lose those, we can't replace that. There's, there's no way for us to artificially come along and do what bees do. That's one species that if you lost it, we would be devastated as, as a human population, devastated, and we'd have to completely change the way we live. So it's not just That's obscure molds that uh, we might come across, which might provide things like penicillin, which it was, an obscure mold that nobody knew a great deal about. Um, you took, you're saying that there's a whole range of ecological services that we rely on now, that we just take for granted? Uh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, some of these species are related to what's going on with the climate. And again, if you lose certain species, you can accelerate climate change. Uh, again, we don't know how um, certain species that might uh, exist in the soil serve to enrich the soil and, and allow plants to grow. There's lots of um, very complex symbiosis between species, and these things, again, allow us to continue to exist on this planet. And we don't really understand that well enough to say, you lose one species and, and we're in trouble. But we're killing species off at such a rate that we could find this point without ever knowing we, we hit it. But Stephen, you're not... You've got I, would a long, agree with, long I would agree with both those arguments. I think they're both powerful arguments. I would, uh, um, I accept that um, politically, um, it is necessary to um, back up the economic arguments, um, and those are important. And I think there are powerful reasons. I, don't, I would certainly agree with Scott there. But I think there is also a powerful um, moral argument. Um, and I think that ultimately that's, that's what gets the general public. The, the general public just hate the thought of living in a world where there is no biodiversity, where there is no true wilderness. Um, that's just an awful thought, I think, for, for an increasing number of people. Um, so you can make that argument, and I don't think it's made often enough, um, that just... Uh, morally, spiritually, humans need it. There's an um, internal sense. But of I fairness, agree. To, I would also totally agree that there are powerful economic arguments. There's an internal sense of fairness with humanity. It's kind of we've we've evolved to try and be fair, and we do feel a bit unfair. It's not just cuddly species, is it, that we feel bad about? It's even species that... Well, well for some people it is. For some people it is, but you were saying, Scott, some species might not be all that cuddly, but actually, without them, we're kind of really screwed. Yeah, it's, it's often the small and even invisible things that are the ones that, if we happen to wipe them out, um, we'd certainly be um, in trouble ourselves. Uh, and look, I, I do agree. The, the moral argument is, a, is one that, that can work, and certainly is one that... Um, I think is, is appealing to a lot of people. But I guess the point I was trying to get at is um, I think the, it's not only a moral issue here that we are, this is 
to our own survival and the perpetual perpetuation of all species on Earth to preserve biodiversity as, as best we can. Um, and I do think, yeah, look, killing species off, that's, that is a morally wrong thing to do. Just as we would complain if aliens turned up tomorrow and decided to wipe us off the Earth. I don't think we'd be too pleased about that, but that's basically what we're doing um, to the other species on the planet. And uh, I, I guess your, your argument, a lot of that is the precautionary, the precautionary principle. Like you're, you're arguing that um, wiping off species may um, may not make any making a, wiping out a lot of species may not make much difference, but it might. There might be this one species or a couple of species where it actually does. Um, certainly, in terms of sort of um, just talking about biodiversity per se, um, there's sort of uh, a lot of sort of literature on trying to say what the effect of sort of species richness is and what benefits it has and and uh, uh, yeah I guess m my, my feeling from it is that there isn't sort of some general consensus that you need to have species richness for this reason or for that reason it's not like this not this there are these big sort of functions that we that we have to have species richness for um, I guess functional diversity is sort of something people talk a lot about functional diversity is related to species diversity resilience, apparently yeah yeah I guess um, I guess some kind of um, yeah, um, you're not going with the flow on this one, are you? Uh, well, well, I guess there's, I guess, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is there's, there's kind of a lot of uncertainty out there, and I guess that was where Scott started this, that we don't know, we don't, if we lose this species, we don't know what's going to happen, and and so, um, like my my feeling is that a lot of the time it's not going to make a lot of difference, and we won't notice sort of a lot of species going, but I guess just if there's some chance that some species might have a big effect, then in, then we should just try to try to try to keep them just in case sort of thing. So are you arguing, Scott, that we're we're messing with, with an engine, that we don't really know how it works, but we're just taking bits off and putting bits on and thinking, oh, no, no, we don't, don't worry about that, that'll be fine. Basically, it's, it's really a dangerous thing. I mean, you wouldn't walk up to a strange machine and start pulling bits off and sticking bits on and and hoping that it, it all worked well for you. And basically that's what we're doing with a very much bigger and very more complex machine upon which in all of our lives, um, Rely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's a first half there. It's something to, to have a think about. Um, you might want to get yourself a drink to uh, drown your sorrows after hearing all of that. Um, uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back for, um, for the uh, for questions. I'm just trying to remind myself of the structure now. Yes, we're coming back for um, 20 minutes of questions, and uh, you'll be taking the lovely Fiona who's holding up a hand right now. We'll take the microphone around. So um, thank you very much. And thank the, uh, our speakers for so far. Thank you so much.